Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is the Geo Fireside Chat. Um, we have uh, six, six of us up here on stage. Um, we'll do intros in a moment. And there are various other uh, Google folks scattered around um, who can also answer questions. So um, uh, I'll start with Peter. Yeah, so I'm Peter Birch. I'm the product manager for the Google Earth API. Uh, so my name is Tor Mitchell. I'm the product manager for the Maps API and the Places API. I'm Susanna Robb, and I am the tech lead on the Maps API in Sydney. I'm J Jayant Madhavan, and I'm the tech lead of the Fusion Tables team. I'm Rebecca Shapley. I'm the product manager for the Fusion Tables team. I'm Dan Chu. I'm a product manager for our Geo Enterprise products. So uh, we were asked just to give a, a, a sort of brief 30-second summary of um, recent announcements, stuff that's going on, just to provide some context. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll just move into sort of town hall-style Q&A. Um, so on the Maps API side, um, our big announcement was yesterday morning uh, we opened up the Places API for general availability. So anybody can go and, uh, and sign up for a key for that. And we also integrated um, Places into the Maps API. So they're now uh, features in the Maps API for searching for businesses and also um, integrated the autocomplete functionality that is on uh, the Google Maps website into the Maps API. So you can now attach that um, to any text field on a web page and get suggestions of, of addresses and of businesses as you type. Um, uh, yeah. So with Fusion Tables, we actually had uh, two exciting announcements, one with the Maps API. Um, you can now do dynamic styling as you use the data from your Fusion Table in a Fusion Tables layer of the Maps API. You can now request that that, that data be styled. Uh, you can change the color of the polygons or, or set the icon for the points and things like that. And you can do that dynamically in your, in your web page. And we are also, at the same time, uh, opening for trusted testers the ability to set the style uh, and the info window template for a given table through uh, programmatically. So that means that if you're sort of preparing a number of tables to have the same, to say have the same look and feel, that'll be easier now. Uh, so on the Earth side, um, one thing I want to announce is that. So last year we're here, we're talking about how many people actually have the plugin installed, and we talked about uh, 100 million computers out there that you know had already had the plugin installed. Uh, and this year, uh, I'm proud to announce that there's now 150 million um, installs. So that basically means that you know 150 million computers out there already have the plugin installed. You know, and all the although the install flow is is very straightforward um, for many of the users, especially the ones who are going to be you know more likely to be using Earth and Earth API. Um, it's already going to be installed there for you. Um, the other thing I should mention is that um, that's new since last year is that we now have a V3 um, extension library. So if that's kind of one of those things that was was holding you back from moving over to V3 or uh, you know sort of part of your factor in, in, in doing a V3, that's something that uh, we're now supporting. Okay, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I should probably just quickly mention, while this was announced at Where 2.0, one of the biggest things, announcements uh, that we're excited about is Earth Builder, uh, a great kind of in the cloud way of kind of um, uploading and styling your um, map and uh, vector and imagery data. Um, and then also in terms of if we're looking kind of over the course of the last year, um, one of the exciting uh, partnerships we also had with the Fusion Tables team was um, for the Maps API Premier enabling kind of private uh, Fusion Tables layers uh, to be displayed. So for many of you who are familiar with Fusion Tables layer, quickly being able to display uh, data that you've stored in a Fusion Table onto a, an easy layer in, in the Maps API, being able to have that completely be private uh, as a Premier customer. OK, so we have uh, two microphones in the room. We have a stand-up mic there, and then we have a roving mic here. Um, this session is being recorded, so um, please be aware of that. Um, when you're asking questions, and also please do wait for the mic to arrive before you start asking your question. Um. Also, uh, if you're going to ask a question at that mic, please just try and line up directly behind that mic so you're out of line of sight of the, the camera. Yeah. Okay, and with that. <laughs> First, um, fusion tables. Uh, I have a 
a bunch of data that I'd like to get out on fusion tables and get out to a map and get it out to the public, but I really don't want the public to get access to the underlying data sets. Um, should I be concerned or not? I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Well, you should be concerned because we, we have a solution for you, right? It's the, uh, the private fusion tables layer. We, we heard that feedback from a lot of folks, right? Um, uh, that there's a kind of a balance in terms of kind of how much access you want others to have to your data. So uh, with the, I guess just to elaborate on the private fusion tables layer, um, you can, it sounds like you're already familiar with the ability to kind of quickly, you know, reference your, your fusion table and be able to display that. In the past, you were, you are basically referring to the requirement to make that table either public or um, kind of protected. Um, now, if you are, uh, along with Maps API Premier, you, all you, there's basically a dialogue within fusion tables. You can input your client ID, which is kind of the key that you're given as you, when you sign up as a Maps API Premier customer. Um, and then that allows you to leave that table as private. Um, but still enjoy the benefits of the Fusion Tables layer. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is kind of a follow-up to his. Um, there, there are customers that need to operate in completely disconnected networks, but a lot of the technologies that you guys have been showcasing is very, very exciting. Is there any kind of plans whatsoever to introduce maybe some of this technology with the Google Earth Enterprise team, uh, bring some of these, you know, KML rendering especially to the Maps API or uh, Fusion Tables to, on a smaller scale to an enterprise deployment that needs to be completely disconnected from the web on, a, on an internal network per se? Um, so I'll take that. So, I mean, absolutely, I think there's a very long history of, you know, a lot of our customers, especially enterprise customers, wanting to be able to work in a, a disconnected environment. And, you know, with the existing Google Earth Enterprise, Earth Client, uh, that's completely possible today. Um, but with, as the thing that uh, Dan mentioned with Earth Builder, um, we're really starting to bring a lot of these services to the cloud and, and allow people to kind of upload and connect and serve that way. But we also recognize the fact that, you know, some number of customers are gonna wanna also be able to have a disconnected experience like that. So we don't have anything specific to announce right now on that, but that is something that we're definitely, you know, very interested in and hopefully we'll have more to talk about. Okay, thank you. I guess um, at the risk of, of saying too much, I would say like, there's probably two responses to that is continued kind of innovation on the Earth Enterprise side. Like we are kind of continuing to invest there and kind of adding functionality there. Like Peter mentioned, it's, you know, it, there's some challenges, right, with a, a completely disconnected environment. I think some things that we've been brainstorming is kind of like an intermediate solution really is kind of more um, a solution that allows you to be disconnected most of the time, but still kind of uh, connect to the cloud every once in a while. And um, that's, you know, that, that's something we've been brainstorming about, not, not at all kind of right around the corner yet. Hi. I wanted to ask a question about Street View in V3. I think this question comes up a lot. It's uh, not quite as nice yet, and I understand people are hard at work on it. Um, but I've also heard that the plan is never to restore the Flash client, and I wonder if that means that IE will be stuck in the ghetto forever. Uh, it's never going to get WebGL. Maybe it'll have WebGL in IE 10, but I'm going to call that never. <laughs> uh, you know, IE 9 doesn't have it, and IE 8 doesn't have good Canvas support. Is IE ever going to get good Street View from Google Maps v3, and how would that ever happen? I'm inclined to say that's a question for Microsoft, but <laughs> uh, but it's not. I mean, v2 has great Street View support in IE. So uh, we we made a a conscious and carefully considered decision that we did not want to maintain two independent Street View implementations um, because, uh, at least within the API, because we wanted to, we felt that in Maps API v2, where we inherited the Street View client used by the Google Maps website, that we were um, somewhat constrained in terms of the features we could offer uh, in the API, and that in a sense, um, the Street View implementation in V2 was more a question of embedding a street view in a page rather than actually um, building a full-blown API experience. And one of the things that was obviously missing from V2 street view was you couldn't place a marker on a street view. Right? You couldn't provide custom imagery in a street view. Um, now, if you think of this in, in uh, if you, you think of the parallel in maps, where would the maps API be if you couldn't put a marker on a map? Right? It was so fundamental. Um, and you know, as a team, 
uh, we, um, you know, we've, we're focused on JavaScript development, um, and we felt like to achieve the kind of things we wanted to do and be able to meet the cross-platform, you know, commitments we'd made, and particularly to deliver across all the mobile devices, which was a big focus of V3, we had to do, um, we had to sort of um, take the jump to uh, a web-based solution. Now, what's, uh, what's you know, difficult is that obviously right now, um, HTML doesn't give you quite the same degree of kind of graphical um, fluidity that you would, you know, the, the people are used to in, in Flash and, you know, WebGL is certainly our, our great white hope for that. Um, I don't imagine that um, we will, uh, I mean, you're correct to say that we don't have any plans to resurrect, resurrect the Flash API. And I think um, we've seen, you know, a, a small amount of demand for that, but certainly not enough to justify what would be a, a significant effort in terms of um, both skill set, you know, resourcing, um, maintaining the two things, keeping them in sync, meaning that whenever we want to introduce one new feature, we have to re implement it in two, you know, twice in different ways. Um, my hope is um, that WebGL will gain a sufficient degree of momentum that Microsoft um, do feel it would be worth in implementing it in IE. 10. Um, sorry? In IE 10. Yes, in IE 10. Um, so in the meantime, I think, um, you know, there are things we can look at doing to, um, potential, to potentially improve the experience in, in IE9. One um, thing also we can do is um, we can improve the experience using Canvas to a limited extent, and IE9 does have Canvas support. And some of our, our first uh, implementations of, of HTML Street View were, were Canvas-based rather than uh, WebGL-based. Um, so there is some hope there that we can um, at least improve the experience, if not make it as good as WebGL. But to a certain extent, I also feel like um, just from a, a technical perspective, as a company, we look to drive the web forward. And um, there's a, a limit to the amount at which I want to, or well, I'm comfortable sort of pandering to um, a dated technology, right? I'd like, to, I'd like to be part of the movement to push the web forward. And if we can make a case for, um, if we can make the case for WebGL stronger, um, then I think, you know, I'd like to do that. Uh, well, then I guess my last question is, the website is currently using the Flash version. Uh, this is awkward. I feel like Google hasn't made that decision very consistently. That you know, if the right decision for the for Google Maps website is to use Flash, isn't the right decision for my website also to use Flash? So this comes back down to the um, you know the question as I mentioned of what do you expect of an API versus what what do you expect of the website? And um, clearly, the uh, the focus for the website has been up to now. Um, you know, just broad availability, right? Um, I want broad availability. Sure, sure. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, we, we don't feel like we can offer the features we want to offer um, in the API and deliver what is actually a, a, you know, an experience that allows you to do flexible and interesting and new and creative things that aren't just dropping a street view into a page um, if we stick with, um, with the Flash-based client. So I think that... Um, I, I, the, the Flash-based client used by the website um, is essentially um, frozen now. Um, and I think that uh, it is, uh, it's inevitable that at some point that will change. Um, and in a sense, we are just a little ahead of the curve there. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking the time to come talk to all of us. I actually have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to periodically step away from the microphone so other people can talk. Um, but uh, all of my questions are pretty much regarding the Places API, so the rest of you can take a nap or drink some water if you'd like. Um, first of all, I noticed that there was a mention that, and there's API support for check-ins on the, uh, the Places API, and that that information is used for ranking. And I was curious if you could get into a little bit more detail as to uh, that check-in functionality as well as it, what other services are feeding that check-in information into the, the ranking of the uh, Places API? So uh, right now, the, the check-in service that the Places API has is essentially a way that developers can signal check-ins to us in order for us to factor that into the rankings we deliver to them. Mm -hmm. um, it is 
unrelated to, for example, the check-in feature that was recently introduced in Latitude. And because the check-in feature in Latitude is associated with individual Google accounts rather than specific API developers or API applications. Um, I th right now, um, if, you, if we have no, um, if we have no check-ins, uh, like if you haven't submitted check-ins or a, a relatively low volume of check-ins through the Places API, your ranking is based purely on the same algorithm that's used for Google Maps. And that algorithm is, um, uh, takes signals from a wide variety of sources and um, you know, check-ins are one such source. So um, you, there, uh, we do expect that you'll get reasonable ranking that will actually be well suited to check-in applications even without providing check-in signals. But it will be sort of generic check-in ranking. It won't be specific to your application. So if your application is targeting a very specific type of business, um, you won't necessarily see those types of business prioritized over others, which is what you will see if you, um, if you submit those check-in signals to us. And I think the tail end of that question is there are obviously a number of Google or Google-backed services that do offer check-in functionality. Are those check-ins flowing into the Places API, or is the Places API only going to use check-ins that are explicitly made through the Places API? The, the check-in based re-ranking we do is per application. So um, we, don't, we don't aggregate check-ins across applications because we don't want one rogue app application to be able to mm -hmm. game the ranking algorithm. So um, the, the ranking, the re-ranking you'll see we do is based purely on the check-ins that you have submitted up to us. Okay. Though there is some, I think you just mentioned also earlier that there is some level of global check-in data that was used, right? The, there is, um, so we, Google has a check-in product built into Latitude, mm -hmm. um, and that is available across all Android devices now. It comes as part of Google Maps and Google Places on Android. Um, and that is generating you know, check-in information that Google uses as a, a ranking signal for its sort of, for the, the ranking algorithm used across all of its products. Um, it's, um, so essentially it's just part of this broader ranking scheme that takes in all number of different signals. Okay. So, um, so it's, not, it's, it's also are not, I should mention though, that the, that ranking algorithm is not real time in the same way that the places like API are. So we take, we take ranking signals um, from Latitude and various other sources, and we take them in aggregate to figure out which places are popular. But we don't do things like um, figure out that there's been a sudden increase in check-in signals from that service. It helps us to understand which bars are popular compared to other bars, but it doesn't help us understand that a game has just started at the ballpark, which is what the Places API can do. Okay, so Places API is a real-time, Places API check-ins are real-time affect the ranking of your services. Yes. Whereas in services like Latitude, and then I don't know if Hot Pot, I guess that is now part, Latitude and Hot Pot are one. Scavenger, uh, do those also flow into like this global ranking even though it's not real time? No, because Scavenger are a Places API partner, so their, rank, their checking signals will only affect the ranking of their own application. Okay, great. <coughs> Thank you for being here, guys. Um, this question wasn't answered by your team last year or the year before, but maybe this year you guys can answer it. Um, I'm a GWT user, and um, I'm stuck in V2 because um, there haven't been bindings programmed by the Google team for V3, and we received word from the GWT guys who had done it previously that they probably wouldn't be doing it and don't expect it to happen. I'm wondering if... Maybe you guys will reconsider since I'm stuck in V2. <laughs> or you can at least impress upon the GWT team, the guys who are doing the GWT, Google API stuff, to move on that. I would say put a, a feature request on the issue tracker, because that's our best way to track interest in these things. And it's certainly something that is possible. And so if we see that there's great interest, we can prioritize that. <laughs> okay, question number two. Um, I'll start with a probably a stupid one. So I, I'm sorry I did miss the announcement yesterday, so that I may ask questions that you answered already earlier at this conference, but um, there was a mentioning of listings providers. I was wondering, it's sort of like a throwaway sentence at the bottom of the requirements, like you will need to show that. Could you go into a little bit more detail as to who listing partners are and what kind of data that is that uh, consumers of the API will need to display? 
If I were to uh, give you the complete list of listing partners, we would probably run out of time. <laughs> um, so these are people, these are companies that you've received listing information from, I believe? Right. So it's not like so advertising or monetization strategies there. Uh, so we, we, license, um, uh, we license local listing data from an extremely large number of sources globally. Um, one of the things that uh, we see as a, a key strength of this API is, is our global coverage. And so to achieve that, um, we have to work with a very large number of partners around the world. Um, in some cases, those partnerships um, uh, require that uh, attribution is shown for the companies concerned when their data is used. Um, and to assist in, in doing this, we provide that attribution string with the place search results in those cases. Now, this isn't always the case. In the US, for example, it's not the case. But it is the case in the UK, in Canada, and Australia. Um, so we will deliver that as a, a HTML string that contains the wording um, agreed and a link to their site. Um, and we just ask that developers include that sort of, you know, for example, at the bottom of the listings, um, just you know, underneath, um, in a similar way that you have the copyrights at the bottom of a Google map. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> um, so with Polygon feature, ed or Polygon editing, um, we can edit the outer boundary, but not any in interior boundaries. I'm wondering if that's on your radar to allow editing of holes within a polygon. When a hole already exists or when, like when it's a solid polygon and you want to add a hole? Okay, make this a two-part question. <laughs> yeah, let's start with, with, with whether one already exists. Um, so we don't have poly editing yet in the V3 API. Um, but I assure you that if you have a hole in the middle, when we do have the feature, if you have a hole in the middle, you'll be able to edit those points as well. In terms of adding a hole, I'd say it's not something that I, mean, I haven't thought through such things, how you would do that necessarily. Um, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, also, it's, it's worth mentioning, we have um, stated publicly we are working on poly, polyline editing. Um, and so it, it should be coming uh, fairly soon. I think um, when you look at the list of V2 features that we want to bring forward to V3 and the things that are stopping people from moving V3, that's one of the last remaining things. Um, uh, I'm certainly open to, to looking into ways we can do, you know, we can implement adding holes. My uh, Initial instinctive, not very carefully thought through concern is that users wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to do that, and so it might be a, it might be hard to make it discoverable as a feature. Just, just a general comment. This, this is a chat, so you know, if you're <laughs> yeah. here, um, if you have questions, you want to learn a little bit more about our APIs. This is a really great chance for you to uh, come up, and you know, there's no. Uh, too stupid question or too hard a question, you know, we'll do our best to answer it, but please take advantage of the, the time to ask about kind of our products. Um, just real quick question, how many people here have actually uh, used Fusion Tables uh, in a site? Wow, that's great. Um, how about um, V3? How many people have actually developed in V3? And then how about, are you still using V2? Okay. Uh, how about Earth API? All right, great. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Let me guess. More places questions. Yeah. Well, actually, I should. I, I forgot to say this at the beginning, but congratulations on the launch of the Places API. It looks fantastic, and it's going to be a great resource for I think a lot of developers. So, um, just want to make sure that that was clear. And it's that all these very targeted questions. Um, so, part of the Places API is also the ability to filter in categories. Now, I was curious where that category information came from, if that came from the listings providers or if that was generated by the Google system and how that evolves over time. Um, it was actually a, a significant effort um, that was, was not done by the API team but done by another team at Google um, to uh, decide on a, um, a single consistent worldwide category scheme um, and then uh, map all of the disparate category schemes from all of the different data providers we work with onto that category scheme. So it is a, um, a Google-specific scheme, um, but um, it, it's, it's one that has had a, you know, a lot of thought, a lot of time, a lot of effort put into it. 
Hi, guys. I was wondering if you would uh, consider uh, allowing people on using uh, the Maps API in JavaScript or in Android to control caching of map tiles so that we could save uh, regions that we knew we would want. <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe there is a, an open issue requesting, requesting offline caching. Uh, it's something that we're aware would be useful, particularly on mobile and particularly on places where the, the network is perhaps not as reliable as we would like it to be or not always available. There are very specific um, sort of licensing considerations around that we need to be careful to protect. So uh, we can't provide a, a mechanism by which you could um, aggregate you know, large volumes of tiles and use them outside of the application. So if we can find a way to allow you to pre-cache tiles such that they are, um, you know, um, you're restricted to using them within the application in which they were cached, then it's something that we could, you know, we can look into doing. Um, but it's not something, you know, to be honest with you, it's not something that we have um, done a lot of work on yet. I think uh, if, uh, as Susanna says, you know, a lot of what we do is driven by the amount of interest we see on the group and in the issue tracker for specific things. Um, so I would say definitely um, register your interest in that, and if it bubbles up, then it will, you know, we will prioritize it accordingly. I have a nicer question, I hope, this time. Uh, the, uh, so I, you made some remarks about you know, the, one of the few remaining issues that keep people on V2. Uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on what the current top priorities are, what people are saying about why they can't move to V3. Uh, you might guess for us it's Street View, but I'm curious to hear what it is in your minds and priorities. Yeah, Susanna makes a good point, which is that you're, the people in this room are probably in a better position to say than, than, than me. Uh, we, we saw throughout last year, you know, when we did the, the graduation announcement last year at, at Google I.O., there were certainly um, a reasonable number of people who felt that, um, who were disappointed to find that the features they needed to migrate were not ready yet. And it was a, it was a, a difficult decision do we wait until every single feature is implemented, or do we only wait until the majority, the features used by the majority of sites are implemented? Um, and, and we chose to, to, to go for the latter route just because we, we were keen to get that process started, to get people thinking about V3 and interested in V3 and, and working towards it. Um, and since then, we've been trying to tick off you know, one thing after another. Um, and I think we've made a, a lot of good progress there. Um, you know, the 45 degree imagery launch was one of them, for example, that a fairly recent one that awesome, thank you. Yeah, that uh, was definitely something that we were keen to get done. Um, I'm trying to think. There's a bunch of things that fell into this category. Yeah, um, the driver directions wasn't in V2, was it? Yeah. So, um, so, so poly polyline editing certainly is is the the one, the sort of the one big one, if you like, that I see. Um, hang on. And um, there are a few things I should mention, though, that will never come to V3, and that's mostly things that uh, were sort of utility classes and things that we had in V2, because back when V2 was launched, there, were no, there was no jQuery and such like. So people in the room, because this is a chat, people in the room who raised their hands that they're still using V2, why? So it's Street View. We've heard poly editing and GWT bindings. Yeah, that was yeah. another one. Yeah, AdSense. That's sense. done. Okay, this is very heartening. <laughs> yeah, so we'll work on those things. <laughs> and one of the things that I think we should also note is that when we're bringing these features to V3, we're trying to bring them better than they were. So we're not necessarily, some of the things may be taking us a little longer because we're not trying to do a direct port. We want it to be better. So Street View, you're not happy with Street View, but to us, Street View is a way better API than it was in V2. Um, there's a, you can do a lot more with it in the API. So we're trying to make that a priority, is to improve the features that were in V2 when we bring them across. I have more questions, but we'll trade. <laughs> so I actually also have a similar question to the question before before um, about caching of the places API responses. I, I didn't see much detail of that on the, uh, the main description page. I was wondering if you go into more detail as to how long you can cache, what the nature of the caching is, rights granted, et cetera. Yeah, so the Places API inherits 
Um, the, place is, as the place is just part of the Maps API, and consequently, it's covered by the existing Earth and Maps API terms of service. Um, and the, therefore, the, the caching restrictions that apply to geocoding, that apply to directions, et cetera, um, just carry over into the Places API. Um, and what we basically say is that um, we understand that it's important for applications to be able to cache um, small amounts of data um, in order to ensure their, app their application performs well um, and in order, to, to, uh, in order to, to build some of the, the, the features that we know people need to build. For example, it's very hard to build a store finder if you can't cache some geocoding information about the locations of those stores. Um, what we don't permit is, um, is sort of bulk offline um, download of data and use of data outside of a Maps API application. Um, we don't publish a um, specific number in terms of you're allowed to cache this data for X days. Um, it's something uh, we're looking into whether we can do, because I, I realize that would um, be helpful. Um, uh, but what you can do is we do provide a, uh, something we call a Places API reference, which is a handle on the place that is opaque, so it doesn't uh, represent um, any useful data in and of itself, but allows you to uh, retrieve updated information for that place at any time in the future. And we uh, worked very hard to make sure those things are resilient to changes. So what uh, you're, you are entitled to do is cache the data that you need, um, and then as long as you refresh that data regularly, as long as you don't use that data outside of the application, and as long as if you ever um, cease providing that application or move to a different source, then you dispose of that data, um, that's OK. All right. Um, uh, I had a question about Terrain View. Uh, ter I, terrain View is gorgeous. Uh, it looks great. Uh, it's a really elegant way of sort of getting a sense of the slopes that are in, the, in a geography. Um, it has a limit on its zoom level. You can't zoom in past a certain point, um, which uh, is regrettable, because I, in some usability tests we ran, users did not understand that Terrain View was the reason why they couldn't zoom in. And they were just like, oh. Oh, I guess I just can't zoom in. They're like, no, just switch views. But you can't tell them that in a usability test, and you can't tell them that in the world. Uh, what can we do about that? Can we switch to map view just at the moment that they want to zoom in a little further? Especially now, you can recolor the map tiles. They can look just like terrain tiles, just no shading. Um, so I'll take that. So I think you know, one of the challenges is that the, the level of data that we have is, is somewhat limited. And there was a conscious decision to, you know, Basically, every level that you go down increases, you know, especially, you know, exponentially increases the amount of data that's necessary to actually serve out the data. So there was some conscious decisions about how far down we want to do that, and, and part of it's based on kind of the overall usage of, of the terrain layer as well. Um, so, I mean, it's good feedback to hear, and I guess I'm I mean, gonna... we definitely use the terrain layer more if, I mean, really at all, yeah. <laughs> you know, if... if we didn't have this usability problem, that people think they just can't zoom in, like they're just trapped. Uh, is there, I mean, how does Google, I mean, I think on Google Maps website, yeah, you just have a limit on the zoom level and that's it. Uh, and I think, as a result, I think people don't use terrain as much as they could. Um, can, can we just glue the map layer down at the bottom? It's like, if you zoom in a little further, I just want, I just want so regular. Saying once I mean, I assume you want terrain layers further down in the hierarchy as opposed to that once you would, get to a certain point, you switch be, back over. That'd right. be awesome, but as a fallback, if I can't get that, and it seems reasonable that I couldn't, okay. uh, yeah, I just want to switch to regular old maps. Uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Virtual Earth does something very similar. They have a shaded view, which is terrain view. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, they also have a limit on, on, on how far you can go. Once you go past that limit, you wouldn't notice. The shades just go away, and they're in a regular map. So with the API, there should be ways that you can listen to the map type ID that has been selected and then in the zoom level. Um, it's possible that you will lose one level of terrain if you listen to that and switch to map as soon as that farthest terrain level is available. It's a good idea. The, the, the zoom control represents you at the, you're, all, yeah. you're basically at maximum now. And maybe I could be like, oh, well, if you crank it up to maximum, it gets a little taller. But it, uh, it looks like you can't zoom in if you're looking at the zoom control. And I don't think we can control that. You can't. That's true. Um, 
it would be interesting to see somebody hack this up in the API because there should be a way to work around it. You can also, I mean, it's the zoom control. If this is if this is your number one feature that you need, the zoom control is a no, very simple view, control. But it's the number two. <laughs> number two. Um, but the zoom control is a very simple control, and if you want this kind of custom functionality, I mean, that's what the API is there for, is to to do that. And I agree that we're sort of we're giving uh, so you, you this limitation. You were suggesting drawing my own zoom control. Is that what you were? If you want, I mean, if this is if this is critical, mm -hmm. right? That's a one way to work around it, and then send us this and be like, "This is what I did. This is how it should work." Um, you know, one option. I know. I know this isn't ideal, but um, it, it may be better than nothing. Is um, if you were to switch to one of the smaller zoom controls, you won't have the slider. Um, and I, I don't know. Personally, I find these days I don't tend to use the slider much. I tend to uh, use the mouse uh, scroll wheel or, or something like that to zoom in. And so if, if your concern is that the visual indicator of your zoom level isn't reflecting the behavior you want, or the behavior you've even implemented if you implement an automatic switch over to a different, different map type when you reach that limit, um, then, then that's a, you know, a possibility. Um, also, I think, I believe, although you know, I'm happy to check this for you afterwards, that the maximum zoom level for terrain is fixed um, globally. Yeah. So, okay, Susanna tells me that is. Um, so, Unlike, for example, satellite view, where we had this problem in the past where the maximum satellite zoom level changes as you go around, and we had to implement a service called get max zoom level that actually tells you what the maximum is at any point. With terrain, you know, okay, if someone wants to go beyond 15 or, or whatever the figure is, then you need to switch at that point to something else. Thanks. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask some dumb questions because I'm here to learn. Uh, I work in an industry where we provide our own terrain. Uh, it's usually design, so some earth modeling software is going to create a design for a new whatever it is, packing lot or whatever. So in Google Earth, we'd like to replace the terrain that's coming in with design terrain. Is that possible? Um, so it's not possible, but it's something that a lot of people have asked about. Okay. So, um, so I'm gonna ask you how you wanna use it. So one question is what, uh, what format would you uh, expect that terrain? Like, how would you like to be able to bring that in and have your terrain just? Well, we have 10, 10 models and grid models, so. It's, 10 and grid? Yeah, so or we can do multi-resolution and grid as well. Um, um, and 10 is vector format, is that correct? Yeah, triangular mesh. Yep. Um, do you ever use uh, any kind of raster-based uh, yeah, map data? that's what we call grid. Okay, so of those two, which would be more important to you? Um, it doesn't matter. We, we regularly go between grid-based software and tin-based software, so we can rasterize a tin um, if we have a tin source. Um, to, uh, how big, um, I'm just gonna pick your yeah. brains for as long as I can here, right? Uh, how big of a uh, terrain patch would you typically uh, have? It can range, uh, we could have, have long highway projects or, or mine projects or small packing lot projects, so you know, you could talk square miles to, you know, just square meters. It, it ranges uh, quite large. So could it be that that one single file might be too big? Because one of the things that we provide in, in Earth and Earth API is this idea of regionation, right? Where yeah. you have sort of a progressive, is that something that would be sort of essential to your application? We, we have some um, uh, multi-resolution uh, techniques and technologies that we already use in our own applications um, that we could serve up you know, uh, essentially the, the patches at the resolution dependent on the viewer um, for you, uh, it, almost as if we could just say substitute or, or just give us that information in terms of proximity and do not bother drawing that, that mm -hmm. surface and let us just pop one in there. And if you had, I assume that you're talking about absolute heights? Yeah, exactly. these, this is all engineered data. So and it's, then what would you expect to happen at uh, a seam between where we're providing data and you're providing data if there we, happens to be yeah, a mismatch? Yeah, we, we, we run into that already. Um, we'll have a, a site limit, and then beyond the boundaries of a site, the engineer doesn't care much anyway. Mm -hmm. So we'll just paste in you know, an, an aerial photo that's pretty rough um, from whatever GIS source. Uh, and, and the user doesn't care because they're not going everywhere, they're just going on their side. So that boundary can be rough or, you know, you could have some kind of um, uh, cliff edge or rough, you know, it, it can look pretty bad, but they don't care. 
Um, is this something that you would hope to be able to use in a website through the Google Earth API? Is there something where you would have data files like uh, a KML or something else that you'd want to be able to uh, view in Google Earth? Well, we use KML right now. We can, we can export to KML and then augment the Google Earth view to show engineering data. Um, so we're doing that already. Um, the first part of your question, could you repeat that? Yeah, I was just asking, where would you want to use it, whether it's in a, a oh, website um, or in, you uh, it, know? Just Websites are fine file. because it has to do with collaboration of you know uh, subcontractors with contractors and owners and and uh, uh, DOTs and things like that. So, you know, having it on a website is great because they can all collaborate over it and they can you know point and talk and what have you. So, from a visualization point of view, it can exist on the web. That's fine. Okay. Well, anyway, that's great feedback. Again, it's something that you know we hear a lot about, and I'd love to just you know maybe even afterwards talk a little bit more about just use cases and you know if okay. we were to do that, what. What would be useful, and and just in general for anyone here, um, we'd love to hear about what we aren't doing, right? I mean, people have been pretty quiet, so we assume that means that we're doing everything great, and you know we don't really need to sweat too much. But my guess is there's things that either are really inconvenient in what we have today, and you have to kind of work around, or there's things that you really wish we would be able to do, and. Um, you know, maybe it's the number one thing in the issue tracker and we just need to get to it. Maybe it's something that, you know, isn't there at all. Um, we'd love to hear about it. So, anyway, thanks very much for the feedback. Yeah, I have one other slight sure. tangent comment. I'd heard in one of the, the sessions you can, do, you can show real-time data within Google Earth through some KML network calls. Network links, yeah. Yeah, so I'm unfamiliar with that, so I'll be going off and learning more about that. Um, but the comment was made that you can do that through Google Maps. The Google Maps implement a subsection of the KML. And I was just wondering, for a, a, a map route, are you just sort of on your own to do your own thing? Or is, is there a recommendation for real-time data on Google Maps? You want to take that? Well, I mean, first of all, you always have the option of doing things through JavaScript to create markers, right? Yeah, so the, right. With it, you know, so the feature that he's talking about is the idea of network links, which is basically a, a little KML file that will specify, it's basically a pointer to somewhere else that then will then specify a refresh rate or uh, you know, under what circumstances it will refresh. So just some examples of that would be, you know, we have a, like a USGS earthquake map that allows you to see earthquakes in the last hour, last day, and last week. Um, and if you just have that file loaded, it's just updating, you know, whether it's every five minutes or ten minutes or whatever the author specifies. Um, same things, we have like a uh, flight, you know, airplanes and flight layer where you can actually see all the flights in the U.S. and where they are, um, and that's just being updated all the time. Um, when you're doing that in maps, um, yeah, so there are some differences and some things that aren't supported when you use pure KML, and that's something that, um, you know, we need to do a better job of, of certain things. Um, you do have, of course, the flexibility that because it's JavaScript, you can actually go off and fetch new data and you know, basically go into the DOM and, or you know, go and change those markers or move those markers based on that feedback. So, or you can use fusion tables. You can use fusion tables. <laughs> uh, like a dynamic. So a dynamic. If, you're willing, if you're willing to venture a little bit outside of, of your standard KML format, fusion tables is basically a tabular data format in the cloud. When you describe a feature, you do describe it with KML. Um, and then you can have other attribute data as well in that table. Um, and then you can use the Fusion Tables layer with the Google Maps API, and every time that page loads, it'll go and look at your data set and say, hey, what should I be showing now? So if you want to go ahead and use the Fusion Tables SQL API to change the data in that table dynamically, okay. then every time that page loads, it'll show what it should be showing. Now, what kind of refresh rate are you talking about that would be acceptable? I mean, I can go to 10 hertz, and I don't think that'll be a good thing. Right? <laughs> yeah, so is it, is it only on refresh, or can you, as a developer, say, I want this to be you know, updating every 15 seconds? It's always live. No, but it, it, no you, you need to reload the page. Well, yeah. on the browser, you don't. For a couple seconds. Yeah, we, um, we implemented a, a map using the API and fusion tables and KML, all of it, um, for some of the disasters that occurred in Australia. And so we had to actually reload the, the I think we were using KML at that point, but reload the KML files. Um, and same thing if we'd been using fusion tables, we would need to reload every five minutes um, and worry about caching. So okay. it's not built in yet. Okay. One more dumb question. 
again, because I'm here to learn. So phrases like Google Enterprise, Google Premier, and then there seems to be some separation between maybe what you guys are doing and maybe there's a different group that's Premier and Enterprise. And there's some, maybe some catching up one needs to do to the other. And it feels like I might be in the Premier Enterprise space. So I just need to figure out what, you know, for someone like me who's trying to figure out how to work with Google, where's my entry point? What, who do I talk to? So I'd, I'd say it does sound like Google Enterprise would be the right entry point. So to your first question, like, kind of what's the connection between kind of the consumer and enterprise offerings? Like, yeah. obviously, it's kind of a very cohesive team. And really, the, the goal of the Google Enterprise team was literally, you know, people saw the consumer offerings, had kind of more business-like uh, needs, and needed like an SLA, technical support, more advanced kind of um, quotas and whatnot. Um, and we wanted to be able to support that, right, and take that, that same technology. And so if you look at, for instance, Maps API, uh, the consumer, and then the Maps API Premier offering, right, the real differences are kind of the terms um, in terms of uh, enabling kind of internal sites, uh, paid offerings. Uh, you can do that with Premier, and that's not something that's, that's really uh, in, in the consumer offering. Uh, 24 by 5 uh, technical support, 99 point. 9% SLA, and then, uh, for instance, in many of the web services, you get um, kind of much higher quota limits. So typically, you get around 2,500 uh, per day on the consumer offering and 100,000 per day, um, and, and you can upgrade from there in terms of both queries per second as well as numbers. So that's just to say, I mean, the goal really is to kind of offer that additional level, right, in terms of kind of functionality as well as, um, and so things like private fusion tables layers was another one that okay. seemed like it was more of an enterprise use case. In terms of kind of the um, engagement model, that's another one that, um, like, right now, t in order for us to scale on a consumer side, we really need to kind of, you know, interact through forums and uh, kind of the starring of feature requests and bugs. But um, on the enterprise side, um, we def if you go to any of these products, they have kind of like a contact us form that directly goes to a sales rep um, who's happy to kind of reach out either through email and phone and directly interact with you in terms of kind of what your needs are. We also have a sales engineering organization that can kind of help, um, help make that technical decision uh, for you. Um, so that would be, I would recommend that as a, as a great engagement model. Okay. How am I doing? Do you guys want to? Great. All right. We've, we've got a, a new gentleman in the back. If maybe he can uh, go ahead and ask Questions his question. Well? Right here. A, a fusion table question? That's okay. So uh, the, uh, the current Android map app is, uh, is vector-based, right? And at least in the U.S., is that right for, for that data? Or is that worldwide yet? Or is there a plan for that to go global? It's worldwide. When will developers be able to have access to that same set of tiles but having vector-based you know, vector mapping inside their apps? This is uh, specifically Android, Android apps. Well, Android initially, but then you know, cross-platform, iOS, you know, other. So the uh, the Android Maps API is part of the Android platform, the Android development platform. Um, that's not a uh, uh, so it's not something that, that us folks here are directly involved in. Um, but I know that um, that there are uh, there are discussions in progress as to how to bring the vector rendering into the Android Maps API. It's, it's obviously something that you know, developers are demanding, and that we want to provide you know, Android developers with the same freedom and flexibility um, that they see in the in the native application. As far as the web-based APIs are concerned, um, the benefits, potential benefits, and opportunities of vector rendering are very clear. Um, but we are at the mercy of of browser <coughs> performance there right now. So it's something that we're keeping an eye on. Um, it's something that um, we're all excited about the, you know, the, the possibilities there. Um, and as soon as it reaches the point where we feel we can deliver an acceptable user experience um, in, in that way, then you know, it's something that we'll, we'll, we'll start looking at. And just one follow-up question. Uh, regarding the Elevation API, is there, uh, is there still an effort to continually get granular, more, more fine grain data on the Elevation side, or, or are we at a in an area where it doesn't make feasible sense to go, de you know, more accurate data. Um, so that's something that you know we're always trying to get more data and get more updates. Um, so I think you know, um, it's really a matter about 
getting access to higher quality data, right? So depending of where you are, like, you know, globally the resolution isn't as good as in the US, and then in certain areas we'll have, kind of like what's happened with, with imagery, right? It kind of starts off with a, a lower resolution, and then over time we can potentially get uh, high resolution insets. So, um, you know, I expect that quality to be getting better over time, especially as we get access to new sources of uh, terrain data. Okay, thanks. Hi, it's a fusion table question. When are we going to be able to do OR queries in selects? I know it's number two on the, the issues list. Can, can, can you say a little bit more about how you would use it? Like for um, plotting contaminants on a map, like where contaminant equals mercury or PCBs for this county. So, so. It's issue number 49 on the. It's, 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 yeah, it's right there at the top of the list, and that hasn't escaped us. We definitely see it there. <laughs> Just one other comment on that. Um, uh, as far as plotting on a map is concerned, you can add more than one fusion table layer to a, a given map. So you can add up to five fusion table layers on any one map. So that is a way you can say, um, you know, you can have one layer for one contaminant, one layer for another. Another approach, um, which is sort of an extension of the same idea, is that the dynamic styling of fusion table layers that we announced yesterday would allow you to, for example, say, I'd like to re render a fusion table layer of all the contaminants, and I'd like to render the mercury in this color, and I'd like to render you know, so on and so on and so on. But that's also limited to five, though, right? So it's limited to five star rules within a single layer, and up to, um, I forget it's right now, um, five layers, one of which can be styled with up to five rules. So, and by combining the two approaches, I think you can get to nine. <laughs> uh, uh, I have one, uh, one final. Just for the folks at the question. back, there are yeah. a lot of empty chairs if you'd like oh, to. Wow. Oh, okay. wow. Easy question, I think. Um, Places API mentions that if you set up billing information, you can go up to 100,000 requests per day. Uh, and it's, it's presumably, if you start exceeding that, there will at some point be a billing structure and pricing system. I was curious if you could shed any light on what that will look like when it's announced. The, um, the requirement to enable billing is actually um, primarily driven by the need for us to strongly identify developers. Um, we did have a, um, a previous offering called the Ajax Search API that offered some local search features. And we had some difficulties there with um, abuse like uh, specifically anonymous abuse. So we wanted to, to be a little more careful this time. So we asked people to, to go through that, that uh, check um, just uh, so that we can provide the kind of levels of quota that we'd like to provide. We don't actually have a current plan to, um, to implement billing. Uh, I think we're more interested at the moment in just, um, if, if there are sites that are generating more than 100,000 place API requests a day, um, they sound like interesting strategic partners for us. Um, and we'd be interested in, in talking to them about you know, what they're doing and what their needs are and ways in which we can work with them and they can work with us. And, and that's the model that we're taking right now in terms of what to do if, if people come to us and, and ask us for those kind of volumes. Okay. I think, okay. Um, one last question. Yes, go for it. All right. Uh, this is a transition from version two to version three. Um, <laughs> G Street View Overlay and Map Dot Add Overlay. Um, how do I do that in version three? I just I just want the blue lines on the map just to show up. I had two lines of code to do it in version two, and I don't know how to do it in version three. So, yeah. So right now the 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 lines appear automatically as you drag Pegman, but you're saying you'd like I'm them not, to appear. I'm not permanently. using your Pegman. Okay. I want my own um, Pegman. Yeah. That's uh, I've seen a few requests for that. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure, again, that there is an, an open issue for that, so just, just flag it. But you're quite right, right now it's not possible. Eh? Okay. <laughs> All right. That's why it's not there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.